Okay, good morning or good afternoon, depending upon what time zone you are in. Uh, we are really glad to have all of you joining us today. My name is Scott. I'm the CEO of the Michigan Israel Business Accelerator. Uh, I think I've met many of the attendees today, but for those who I've not met before, it is a pleasure hosting you today for our Connecting Communities event, where we pride ourselves in bringing together Michigan businesses, government officials, as well as different stakeholders from around the state of Michigan to really explore partnerships with our colleagues in Israel to accelerate Michigan's innovation ecosystem, one Israeli innovation at a time. Um, I have the gift of working uh, with so many wonderful people, both here in Michigan as well as in Israel. And as we think about the opportunity for partnerships and co collaboration, never is that needed more than now. And so really excited about the opportunity to spend roughly the next hour or so with all of you. Uh, we'll wrap things up about one o'clock today, maybe a little bit beforehand. But we're really going to dive into some pretty interesting things today around some of Michigan's challenges and areas of innovation that Israel can bring to potentially address some of those things. Things like in the water sector, think about energy. Think about food and ag agricultural technologies that, that Israel has done over its years of it, since its existence, again, established in 1948. But Israel's growth in that span and its time frame has just been, it's been exponential and so impressive from what it was as a desert. And now as Israel is truly ag agriculturally independent. And so, um, you know, there's, I think, a lot of interesting areas and topics of discussion we're going to explore today. We're really lucky we have some great guests who will be joining us from one of the leading teaching institutions in Israel, Ben-Gurion University. I personally have been to Israel 12 times. Um, I've been there twice since October 7th. And I'll just, you know, from a, by way of my perspective, my last two visits have quite honestly been the most impactful um, just the the warmth of how I've been received by so many Israelis, both, and I'm talking about all of Israel, so Arab Israelis, um, Jewish Israelis, just Israelis. And so the Michigan Israel Business Accelerator, we pride ourselves on building partnerships and forming genuine collaboration opportunities that are going to really grow Michigan's economy, ultimately to create jobs. So really, really lucky today to uh, to welcome our guests from Ben-Gurion University and from Ben-Gurion uh, for um, as as oh, as well as America's for Ben Gurion University as well. So with that, Rachel, if you could please roll the video.
Hello, and welcome to all of you, and thank you for being here. My name is Ari Steinberg, Senior Director of Development for Americans for Ben Gurion University, and I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank Scott, as well as everyone at MIBA and our team at A4BGU for putting together this really wonderful collaborative event. I think you're really going to enjoy our program today. Before I introduce our featured speakers, I'd like to share just a couple of words about Ben Gurion University. David Ben-Gurion, Israel's first prime minister, envisioned that one day there would be an Oxford in the Negev, where we would make energy from the sun, water from the air, and food from sand. And BGU is bringing his vision to life. The only Israeli university created by government mandate, BGU was established in 1969 with a mission to be an engine for the development and growth of Israel's Negev region. With some 20,000 students in three campuses in Be'er Sheva, Stabokir, and a lot, BGU is truly an oasis of innovation leading research in cyber and homeland security, alternative energy, desert and climate studies, water research, global health, medical technologies, Israel studies, culture and Jewish thought, high tech and robotics, and so much more. BGU is not just a place where we have the name of Israel's first prime minister hanging on our front door. Rather, we are a modern day manifestation of his ideas for the Jewish people and the Jewish state. At A for BGU, Americans for Ben Gurion University, we do three things, and all of them are in fulfillment of David Ben Gurion's vision for the Negev and the future of Israel. First, we raise awareness for the remarkable BGU uh, through programs just like this one. Uh, we also raise financial resources as the majority of philanthropic support to the university comes from the United States. And of course, we also run programs like our signature Zinn Fellows Leadership Program that immerses the next generation of American leaders in both the Negev and BGU's vital work. As you just saw in the video, and many of you know, the university was directly and unfortunately disproportionately impacted by the October 7th uh, terrorist attacks. Now more than ever, BGU stands as a beacon of hope and light for the future of Israel and is a vital part of Israel's rebuilding and recovery efforts. Uh, Scott just mentioned his visits to Israel, and I'll mention that, uh, and I had to double check this, this date, but 40 years ago today, I paid my very first visit to Israel, and I would like to take this opportunity to uh, invite all of you to come and visit the Negev. Uh, my, on my first visit, I remember going down to uh, down south and passing Beersheba and thinking that it was a rather small, quiet town. My, uh, it, how it has changed, and I would like to uh, to invite all of you to to reach out to either Scott or myself. We'd love to arrange a, a visit to the Negev and to BGU if you have the time. Today we have a wonderful program featuring uh, Josh Peleg and Shirley Shepherd Hoffman. Josh Peleg began his role as CEO of BGN Technologies just last year. He has more than 20 years of experience in senior managerial positions, both in the private and civil sectors, with a focus on agritech and biotech. Prior to coming to BGU, he served as CEO of Zraim Gedera and head of the commercial unit at Syngenta Israel. He has also worked at the Foreign Trade Administration at the Israeli Ministry of Industry, Trade and Labor where he served in the role of Israel's commercial attache in Mexico for four years. Previously, he worked as an attorney. Josh has a BA in philosophy from the University of California, Berkeley, and an LLB from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. We are also uh, pleased to introduce Shirley Sheffer Hoffman, who joined BGN in 2017 and leads the business development of the climate technologies at BGN, her career includes serving as VP Investments of Capital Nature, incubating and growing early stage startups in clean energy and smart transportation. Previously, she spent eight years with Poalim Ventures, an Israeli-based venture capital firm. 
And prior to the VC arena, she held diverse high-tech companies uh, uh, positions, both in marketing and development roles. She holds a BSc in computer science from the University of Massachusetts and an MBA from Tel Aviv University in Israel. It is my pleasure to introduce, introduce both Josh and Shirley. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ari, and uh, welcome everybody. Good afternoon, morning, evening, depending on where you are. Uh, so I'm Josh Pelling, and I am the CEO of BGN Technologies, which is a subsidiary of Ben Gurion University. We're a company that was set up to um, do the technology transfer from the university. Uh, the university was was just presented, but uh, I'll mention that also that uh, the BGU is one of Israel's largest universities. Uh, possessing virtually every faculty uh, imaginable, uh, save for a law school, and um, they, uh, the university has fully one third of all uh, of Israel's uh, researchers in the engineering fields uh, who are employed there, and uh, we churn out every year a third of all of Israel's engineers, and, and that's relevant uh, because of what we do at BGN. What we do is we uh, have three main functions. One is we are the body which is in, uh, responsible for connecting researchers and researchers labs with the industry and getting the industry to come and to uh, sponsor research agreements. Um, so that that's those are agreements by which an industry can um, can define a project that they, that they would like a researcher to work on uh, and the researcher they would fund that project and the researcher would then develop uh, the technology that would then go back to the uh, to the company that funded it, uh, and this is a uh, this is a mechanism that we use. We have about sixty to seventy of these types of agreements every year uh, with with Israeli companies, with American companies, uh, large multinationals, uh, some of which have uh, projects that they have been funding for many many years. We have uh, deep relationships with Deutsche Telekom, uh, with companies like Fujitsu and Toshiba uh, and Lenovo. Um, so, so, so these are, um, this is a, a, a major, uh, source of our activity. Uh, the second, uh, function that we fulfill is we are, uh, the body that is responsible for all the intellectual property of the university. We hold the intellectual property. We decide which inventions or which discoveries that came out of the labs are, uh, discoveries that we want to, uh, apply for a patent around it. And then once we've decided to apply for a patent, we will uh, develop a commercialization plan for those technologies to take those technologies out of the university and put them into the hands of companies. Um, there are two main ways that we that we do this. One is we will look for a an existing company uh, that is interested in this field of technology, uh, and that company will get a license to the technology. We'll continue to develop it because many of these technologies are very, very early stage, having just come out of a lab. Uh, so the company will will invest money in, in developing that technology, and ultimately, we hope, will include that technology in its in line of products. Um, and uh, from the revenue of, of the sales of those products, uh, some royalties will come back to the university to fund further research. Uh, that's one way we uh, commercialize. The second way we commercialize uh, is we uh, set up startups of our own. We'll spin out a company out of the university. Uh, we will find an entrepreneur, a, a CEO for the company, uh, investors, uh, and uh, we will put the technology, place that into the company, uh, into that startup, and then help that startup grow and uh, and uh, get investment and continue to develop the technology. Uh, we have currently, we've started up more than 150 companies. Um, we hold at least 70, 80 companies still in our portfolio. Uh, I, I don't have the time to talk about Israel as a startup nation, but just uh, just to give some numbers to that, there are more than 7,000 startups in Israel. Uh, it seems like everybody has at least one startup in their garage, uh, and uh, university researchers at BGU are no different. So we have many, many startups that we are we are putting together, and that is a uh, a uh, one of the, the main ways that we are commercializing technology. Um, our third function, which is uh, somewhat particular to uh, to BGU. Uh, I think, as I already mentioned, BGU was 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 established by government mandate, and the point of uh, the of establishing the university over 50 years ago was to help develop the Negev uh, periphery, the, the the desert region of Israel. Uh, and so we see ourselves as uh, fulfilling and and continuing that mission by representing the uh, the university 
uh, in all sorts of projects to uh, promote the economic development of the Negev region. Uh, and this is a particular function that we that we do, and we do it quite actively. Uh, we're involved in many um, technology incubators and government programs to uh, to help promote innovation and technologies and develop uh, an infrastructure. We sit in an industrial park, a high tech park with some uh, uh, 6,000 employees currently in this park uh, that did not exist 15 years ago. It was set up by the help of the university on university land to attract uh, multinationals, to attract Israeli companies, R&D centers, uh, venture capital, to come to Beersheva and help develop this, this beautiful area of the country. Uh, so that is what we do. Uh, and uh, Shirley, uh, I'll just introduce her briefly, is, is responsible for uh, business development uh, of uh, of the climate tech sector. We are divided into three sectors at BGN, uh, climate tech, uh, engineering and exact sciences, and bio and, uh, and medical devices. Uh, and climate tech is one of the, uh, maybe the, the diamond in our crown, in our crown at, at Ben Gurion. There's a specific emphasis, and we'll talk about that uh, during the course of this call, specific emphasis on technologies uh, helping to uh, deal with uh, the various challenges that climate change is, uh, is posing. So uh, maybe we'll bring it back to Scott. We'll bring Scott back into the conversation now. There he is. Okay, perfect. So so uh, Josh and Shirley, thanks for the introduction. Uh, and then Ari, thank you for your comments. And we too really value our partnership. Uh, I personally have been out to Ben Gurion University now, I think two or three times and, and uh, so just anecdotally, ladies and gentlemen, as we talk through today, so this is, uh, I'm gonna serve as the moderator. We have some questions, but if you have any questions you'd like us to ask, if you wanna drop those into the chat and then we'll work through the audience Q&A along with some of the pre-prepped uh, the, the pre questions that we have for our experts. And today's somewhat of a casual discussion, right? Uh, you know, and, and we really wanna make it about just the opportunity for building genuine partnerships and collaboration. Um, and so, you know, I talked about how I've been to Israel 12 times and, and I've been out to Ben Gurion. And so I've driven out there. I've also taken the train. And the thing that's interesting about my trips is I think about my kind of my ride out there, Josh and Shirley, is while I sort of pictured in my head going out through the desert, it was quite the opposite experience. I saw farm fields and all sorts of different types of agricultural opportunities for growth. And then one of the differences though in those farm fields that I didn't see, that I see all the time here in Michigan is these really large sprinklers, right? And so let's, let's, let's you know, perhaps our first topic here we'll sort of dive into will be water, you know? And so for us Michigan folks, you know, we're pretty familiar with our stats, but for those folks who maybe might not be, I'll just get into a little bit of the depth on on, on Michigan and that it's it's a well-known fact here in Michigan that you're never six miles away from some form of a body of water. <laughs> so think about that. You can drive six miles or less and be in some contact with a with a body of water, a river, a lake, um, or one of the Great Lakes, right? So Michigan is home to essentially one-fifth of the world's fresh water supply. The Great Lakes area, right? In Michigan, rests on two peninsulas, right? We are based on two peninsulas, which is a really interesting. We're surrounded by water. Uh, we have more than 11,000 inland, inland lakes. And clearly water is a part of our ecosystem. It's part of our tourism. And we take it for granted, quite honestly, I think here in Michigan. Um, Israelis don't. And that's an interesting thing, right? But the thing about our here in Michigan as compared to the Western US, right? Water is not necessarily as available, they're having some significant challenges uh, in the, you know, in the West Coast region, Arizona, New Mexico, Southern California, around water, and you only really need to look at some of the droughts we've experienced here in the U.S. Um, some of the increasing wildfires, water scarcities. There's a lot of things happening, so we have water, water everywhere. But in some instances, a lot of that water is contaminated. Um, you know, whether it's it's you know our drinking water where we have had some challenges with lead pipes and and that's because building codes for many years, uh, lead pipes was essentially the the norm, the normal for when uh, you know houses were built and they had lead service lines running off the water mains all the way to the houses. We also have issues with P PFAS, also known as sort of forever chemicals. And for those folks who aren't familiar with the term PFAS, 
PFAS is the, you know this nickname of a forever chemical because it doesn't it's hard to get rid of. So and it was used very ubiquitously around the United States, whether it was like on stain master carpeting or in couches or a lot of other chemicals back in the 80s. And unfortunately, a lot of those chemicals, PFAS in particular, has been now linked to potentially causing cancer. So lots of, you know, lots of areas of potential water contamination. Plus, we have other issues of water runoff from our farmers' fields and all sorts of other stuff with these algae blooms and other types of blooms in the Great Lakes. So certainly some things to consider on our side. So, you know, then finally, let's talk about water reclamation and essentially water conservation. Here's a fun fact, and it's a big, interesting fact for those folks on the call. So on average, the United States, we um, reclaim about 3% of our water on average. The country next in line would be Spain at 12%. Israel reclaims 90% of its water, right? And so I wanna talk about water, I think here a little bit with the audience today. Clearly, Israel is doing something different. I think there's some lessons to be learned here. And so let's talk about water. And, and uh, you know, perhaps either maybe Josh or Shirley, whoever wants to take this question, can you kind of provide an overview? You know, I guess maybe Josh, if you want to take this first one, an overview is of Israel's water system and maybe what ex specific examples you can maybe point towards what Israel has done. Um, and, and maybe what Ben Gurion University is doing today to really help address some of these water challenges when you think about how you're placed in a desert. Sure, Scott. Uh, actually, I'm going to echo uh, your your trip through uh, on the train to uh, to Ben Gurion. So I, I'm currently actually in California, where I grew up uh, for a visit, and I uh, just uh, yesterday was driving across the Central Valley of California, which I remember as as water, water everywhere, and very, very lush. And what I'm seeing is a desertification, desertification of of really the the breadbasket or the cradle of of all that uh, of all that uh, vegetable production area. Um, so so it's a challenge, and and you see it in in different places. I don't wish this type of challenge to Michigan, but I understand uh, Michigan has its challenges, and and maybe we'll, we can see how uh, how we can. Um, how we can connect there in in our region in Israel water is 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 if it's not the biggest issue it's one of the biggest issues i mean wars have been fought over it peace agreements have included it we our peace agreement with jordan had a, a large chunk of that big chapter has to do with water allocations from the jordan river and how much we'll be able to take out and how much we need to give um, for most of the, the, the history of, uh, of Israel, there was almost a total dependence on drawing water either from the Sea of Galilee or from aquifers uh, in, in, in the center of the country. Um, but the growth in our population uh, has really required us to, to develop a more independent uh, or independence uh, in our water system. Uh, certainly, uh, many years of drought have also uh, exacerbated uh, that need. Uh, and what we did was, as a country, we uh, developed, first of all, five very large desalination plants uh, and dozens of other smaller desalination plants, which are based on, on reverse osmosis technology, which uh, maybe Shirley will talk a little bit about. That's a uh, actually a Ben-Gurion invention uh, way back when. Um, so those uh, desalination plants now produce 85% of our drinking water supply. Um, and that is a, a radical change, and that has given us uh, a lot of breathing room and, and independence from from uh, from uh, from droughts and from dependence on on how much rainfall we will get. Um, at the same time, as you said, Scott, nothing, no drop is wasted. Um, that ninety percent uh, reclamation rate is actually going up. Um, we are trying to really get every single drop uh, from our wastewater, uh, and when then we treat that and we put that into agricultural, typically. Uh, and that is um, agricultural or, or, or industrial use. Uh, and between those two, um, between those two sources of water, the the desalination, uh, we do still do some pumping from the uh, from the aquifers, but uh, mostly desalination and from uh, wastewater treatment, we're able to supply all of our needs. Um, water in Israel, as opposed to what I see here in California, uh, water is a national a national resource. It's it's not private property. Uh, and the Israeli uh, uh, national, at the time, the, the, the national uh, water company, Makarot, uh, established a basically a water grid, which is very much very similar to an electric grid, uh, where we are able to generate water at different points in the country through desalination plants, and then deliver that water basically from one point of the country to any other point in the country. And, and depending on 
where that water source is coming from, what the water needs to go to, whether it's reclaimed water or it's desalinated water. We have this very, um, very complicated, but very well working grid, uh, which supplies water to all areas of the country. Um, we do not have Michigan's problem uh, of water contaminants, uh, specifically lead contaminants. Uh, and we understand, and I certainly understand, I remember these stories from Flint, the, 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 uh, the health impacts and, and how severe that could be. Um, it is a, it's a fairly minor issue in Israel, probably because uh, our pipes were laid much later in, uh, in, in, uh, in terms of uh, 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 the evolution of, of water management. And so we did not have lead there. Our, our, we have other concerns that we have other types of contaminants, um, specifically salinity, which is sort of the major uh, 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 issue in now in groundwater due to uh, overpumping from the groundwater sources. Uh, and I don't believe that Michigan has that issue. Um, other issues that we have probably in common have to do with PFAS, I think, which you mentioned, nitrates, uh, nitrate runoff from agriculture, which is a, which is a, a global issue, uh, arsenic, which can be found in our groundwater, and certainly microplastics, um, which we have everywhere, I believe, in the Great Lakes, it's also a major issue, um, and certainly uh, other industrial pollutants, pharmaceutical waste, which has infiltrated the supply what we um, what we do at BGU is that we have a specific actually we have a water a leading water institute and it's not just uh, a leading in Israel it's it's an international leading water institute in our campus in Stable Care which is south of Beersheba uh, there are two main departments in that institute environmental hydrology and microbiology uh, and we also have a desalination and water treatment department uh, and so we have researchers working on a lot of different issues having to do with water quality and water management. Um, I think maybe I'll turn it over to Shirley if she wanna talk about anything, uh, any kind of specific technology, Shirley. Um, sure, sure. So um, I actually had a very difficult time trying to choose just uh, you know two uh, examples to stay in the water because water is a big uh, issue. We also um, lead a water energy nexus consortium with a uh, U.S. Uh, energy of uh, Department of Energy, and it's part of the track in the U.S. Israel um, Energy Center. So we have quite a few uh, joint uh, joint projects with them that we put into POC in the U.S. and in Israel in parallel. So I've selected um, one example, which really tackles the contaminated wells, which is a, a, a problem because many of the wells that we have in Israel basically with time have become contaminated and therefore cannot be used anymore. And this is a global issue. I'm not quite sure where that stands in uh, Michigan. So this is a patented novel system that's based on a combination of an ion membrane contactor that operates in tandem with a separate bioreactor. Uh, we have quite a few researchers working on very uh, advanced um, membranes used for different uh, reasons. And in this case, it's, uh, it works together with a, with a bioreactor that basically uh, does bioreduction and decontamination of the water from a variety of harmful ions that are in the water. So basically, it enables taking an unusable well and making it uh, reusable again. So um, this is mostly relevant for drinking water um, as well as, uh, as irrigation water. So that's uh, one technology that we're proud of and is already working in several places in Israel and kind of uh, expanding the type of uh, contaminants that this can deal with. It already works with uh, para uh, perichlorate and uh, now being uh, into arsenic, et cetera, et cetera. The list uh, can go on. There's too many contaminants. So that's one uh, technology I wanted to mention. Um, another technology I want to mention is regarding PFAS because I know that's a common problem. So um, one um, sensor that we have is uh, currently under testing. It's very unique because it has a, an ability to be very low cost, um, be managed remotely, and it's also uh, portable. So, and also the main thing is that it identifies both short and long PFAS molecules. Sounds scientific, but in fact, the whole uh, PFAS is a huge list of, of different molecules, and the list grows uh, longer and longer as the time goes by. And regulators globally basically just update the list of, uh, of PFAS molecules that are uh, regulated. So it's a dynamic issue. And most of the sensors today can easily deal with short PFAS uh, molecules, but have a very hard time dealing with, uh, with longer molecules. Um, and in addition, they're expensive and, and, and difficult to, to maneuver from place to place. So this is uh, one technology that we think is very exciting and has a 
a real future. Another PFAP um, technology is, is a material. More specifically, it's a photocatalytically uh, regenerated carbon-based adsorbent material. So it can both um, uh, absorb, but on the other hand, it also neutralizes the PFAS molecule. So this is uh, one of the first systems um, globally that actually can um, help alleviate the PFAS water in actual waters rather than just uh, kind of alert on, a, on the situation. Um, I could go on and maybe describe, um, um, maybe I'll do that when we talk about agriculture. I was going to describe uh, a company that we have uh, started, so. Yeah, so, so those, yeah, those were very, really kind of helpful examples. And I think, you know, there's some, obviously some challenges. Arsenic is something that exists in a lot of individual wells here in Michigan. I think we talked a little bit about this as well during the prep session, right? Our, our water systems usually kind of draw from some of the main water bodies around the state. There's also individuals who have individual wells at their home. Um, I actually personally have that at my house and my drinking water well goes down roughly almost 200 feet. But the aquifer in my area, um, there's some challenges with ar arsenic and that's in, it's and so they're consistently having to kind of track the aquifers movement to see where the aquifer or how that arsenic contamination that started from a, a facility when I see a facility that's been long gone, it's been gone for probably 30, 40 years, but it was, you know, it was placed, um, it was only a few miles away from where my home is. So, you know, again, the industrial age did some wonderful things to help move the world forward, but it also, I think we learned some unfortunate lessons and we're facing those lessons today when it comes to our water. Let's talk a little bit about, about, you know, one of the topics du jour I hear a lot about, not necessarily about just Israel, but just a, in the conversations we're having here in Michigan and around our teaching institutions here in Michigan, around, you know, here as well as around the United States. Let's talk about AI for a minute. And, and you know, clearly artificial intelligence is, is changing the world in so many ways. And you only need to look at Cortana on your computers or Google launched actually an update today. It actually hit my computer today talking about ways to leverage artificial intelligence and talking to my computer and it'll do certain things for me, right? But let's talk about AI and water. You know, that's a complex topic, right? Because you think about sensors, you think about leveraging real-time technologies to sort of notify people about drinking water contamination. But, but, you know, I think it's the prevention, it's the mitigation. So who wants to really kind of talk a little bit about how we're, how, you know, maybe Ben-Gurion or Israel might be leveraging AI as we think about just drinking water or wastewater? So, so I'll throw out something. The, the, uh, I mean, AI is is a topic, obviously, that we're addressing in in, in virtually every field these days. And in fact, Scott, we could, this this conversation we're having now could probably be done by AI. We could all go home and 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 have some coffee. So, so the um the AI specifically in Israel is uh there's I I would say the the initial source for a lot of our AI development came from uh from the army and from from various uh, um uh from from various units within the army that was that were studying ai for probably for military purposes and now have different types of civil civilian applications that um um that that are 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 connected to to the topics that we're talking about water agriculture uh, energy uh so so the actual basis system is is fairly similar in the, in the case of water uh, AI is already being being used for uh, sensors for leak detection. For example, we have even some Israeli companies that have been established based on that, where where the detection of leaks uh, uh, is not just a physical detection of where the water is coming out, but it's really understanding use patterns and being able to understand these anomalies in the, that are happening in the in the in the drawing out of water, and being able to uh, to give an alarm whether there's a there's a there's a leak or not. Uh, that is both. On the home use level, so we actually have companies that that have products for for home use, and and also on the system wide level for the national water carrier, be able to determine whether there's any uh, leaks. Um, we're using AI for the detection of contaminants again, uh, based on these types of models, where where um, where predictive models where we're able to understand where 
how uh, contaminants may flow. For example, your your problem with arsenic is probably uh, a, a an interesting dilemma that AI could uh, could could weigh in on, being able to predict where that's going to flow in the in the uh, the underground reservoirs there. Um, also, in terms of um, the operation of desalination plants, uh, so AI is now being effectively used there uh, to determine. Uh, both when there'll be peak needs, um, how energy is being used more efficiently in, in the operation of those plants. And I should say that desalination, one of the names of the game is to be able to do it at, uh, at the right price point. So we, we, we tend to, or we try to at least incorporate as, as much renewable uh, energy there as well. But, but utilizing the energy and which energy to use at which particular time is usually uh, done now by predictive AI models. Uh, so those are all things that are happening in, in Israel and in, in, at Ben Gurion specifically. We have uh, a lot of work going on in AI in in, in all the fields. Uh, I don't know if Shirley wants to if we have a particular uh, technology that you want to put. I actually think that maybe this is a good point to mention the company yeah. we spun off a while back, um, which basically its main technology started off as identifying nitrates in in soil and due to irrigation of of the soil. And um, what has grown now is a company that actually also has a lot of AI because what they do is do a lot of calculations of A, where the nitrates are gonna flow in the, in the ground because nitrates seem to be very dynamic. But in addition to basically give models of fertilization because most of the nitrates have uh, contaminated the, the ground basically because of over fertilization. So uh, basically gives the model of when to fertilize, how much, where in the field, depending, and that also depends on the on the crop, on the uh, upcoming weather, on uh, actual irrigation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that is one example that is um, very much on our table. So it's it's interesting. I think this is a great opportunity to pivot to talk food and ag tech a little bit as we're thinking about fertilizers. We're talking about obviously nitrates and. And obviously, the relationship between water and the agricultural industry is, you know, one, they, they, it's very mutually symb symbiotic. You need one to survive the other. Um, so just a little bit of a, for those folks who aren't necessarily familiar with Michigan's agriculture and food tech side, and, and we'll end up probably in this next part doubling back a little bit to water tech, as well as food and ag tech, just because of the relationship between them. Um, just as we think about statistics, so first, Michigan is home to roughly 47,000 farms, um, and they utilize 10 million acres of farmland. Uh, we're the number one producer of a number of different types of products, so squash, cherries, cucumbers, dried beans, sugar beets. Um, Michigan ranks number two in terms of, in the country, by the way, number two in the country for agricultural diversity. Right, and so that's an interesting fact because you think about obviously when farmers and circulating of different types of crops on their fields, right? So Michigan does really well. It's a really diverse ag agricultural state. Um, and then you think about obviously just the production ag agriculture and food processing and the related businesses, those really contribute a lot to the state's workforce and important to know that, right? So over 800,000 people work in the food and ag tech industry here relative to just what Michigan, that, that's about 17% of our population. And that's 104 billion, with a big B, $104 billion towards our state economy every year. That's significant and strategic, right? Michigan, a lot of people think of Michigan as just like, you know, car, car companies and manufacturing. And there's so many different little known gems about our state and food and ag tech is one of those. Um, so, you know, we're the number one producer of, of tart cherries. That's a fun fact. A lot of people wouldn't necessarily know that. Um, although ironically, this year has been a bit of a challenge from an agricultural perspective uh, when it comes to our cherry production. Um, apples are doing very well this year. So, Again, I could go on and on about just the different numbers associated with the food and ag tech space, but let's pivot to a question now. Once I kind of lay the groundwork for you know what what Michigan's doing, you know when we consider Israel's history, you know can you talk about Israel's agricultural industry, just how far it's come in 25 years, in the last 25 years, right? And its goal, and I read this in a book a number of years ago, 
you know, to becoming agriculturally independent. I think it set a goal of like 25 years or something. It did it in 10. So that's fascinating. So let's talk about that. And, and you know, specifically your thoughts or perspectives on, on Israel's strengths, maybe Ben-Gurion's, you know, contributions to Israel's strengths in the agricultural space and areas for growth and opportunity. Uh, sure, Scott. I mean, I, you, they read my bio. So, so agriculture is my sweet spot. My, my previous company was an agricultural company. I worked for a, a vegetable seed uh, company um, and uh, actually even vid- visited Coldwater, uh, Michigan to, uh, to see Israeli tomatoes being grown in Michigan greenhouses, uh, which is quite a sight. Um, so we'll talk a, a little bit about agriculture. I think, I think the, the sentence that best sums it up uh, in Israel is, is more food on less land for more people, uh, and 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 that's what we need to do, and that's that's been our mandate uh, um, in, in that sector. The government did declare that we need to be self-sufficient in agriculture. Um, we have very little arable land to do that. Uh, so so the name of the game is intensive agriculture, uh, and that means growing more food on, in, in less space and using better technology to be able to grow in places that normally uh, you, one would think that you could not grow uh, 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 crops. Uh, I'll just uh, I'll, I'll open a sidebar here. I think Israel has an int- uh, I mean, I, 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 it's, that's news to me about Michigan's diversity. I think it's very interesting. Israel, I believe, also has a tremendously diverse uh, crops because to be self-sufficient means that you grow both wheat and kiwi fruit and mangoes and tomatoes and and watermelons and artichokes. Uh, and so we, we've got it all going on. Um, but at, you know, not at the scale, obviously, of Michigan or, or of any of the... Uh, 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 that we would see in other countries that are that are major producers. Um, we have gone actually from a nation wh- which used to um, we used to export our agricultural exports were were Jaffa oranges, right? So back in the 1950s, one of our biggest export items in the, for the state of Israel was exporting oranges to Europe. Uh, and we have gone from exporting oranges to exporting agricultural technologies at this point, um, and that covers a very wide gamut. It maybe started with um, with breeding of new varieties of, of vegetables, like to, like tomatoes, the cherry tomato was basically um, the modern cherry tomato was invented in Israel. One of the inventors, one of the co-inventors, was a uh, BGU researcher at the time. Um, so so Israel is very good at, and we continue to do this to do this to do classical breeding, which uh, which means basically cross pollinating different plants in order to come up with traits that the world requires. More and more, of those are traits for uh, being able to grow in areas that typically we, uh, were not uh, considered uh, uh, arable areas for, for, for agriculture. So it could be because of salinity, it could be because of drought, it could be because of soil contaminants. Uh, and we will actually breed plants that have tolerance to those types of things or to, to weather conditions that are constantly changing. And we continue to do that. We use modern technology as well, like CRISPR technology. Um, but Israel, I think, is at the com, com, maintains its, its, its leading role in the world in being able to breed new varieties of, uh, of crops. Um, we uh, invented drip irrigation, so that's probably less widely used in Michigan, but I, I saw it now in California and, it, and certainly in, in many parts of Europe and in South America and in China now, the drip irrigation system, which was invented by Israel uh, with Netafim, an Israeli company, and uh, three or four other Israeli companies um, that are in the, in the same sphere. Some were, one was bought out by John Deere a while ago, uh, so that is, that's also an Israeli invention. Uh, we utilize sensor technologies now, and I think Shirley mentioned one of them, but many, many, many different types of sensor technologies, robots for harvesting uh, and for other uh, tasks at, at the in the uh, in the farm, uh, AI for labor management. Um, so we call this precision agriculture. And what it does is it increases the pr- productivity of agriculture while optimizing the farm management and the efficient use of water and pesticides and nutrients and other inputs, enabling us to grow in very small plots of land, a uh, tremendous amount of yield of, of, of crops. Uh, it also means that there's less emissions. It means that the soil health is maintained. It means we need less labor. Uh, and, and, and so for Israel, this idea of intensive precision agriculture is the name of the game. Um, 
In Michigan, as I said, I was in cold water and I see that that's going on there. So you are utilizing uh, um, this type of uh, these types of methods in order to grow in regions which typically you wouldn't be able to grow tomatoes, for example. Um, we in Israel and at, at BGU have been utilizing our strengths, which is a, which is really ICT and data mining and software to develop a lot of different type of technologies. Uh, the brains behind a lot of these technologies are Israeli. Um, we use our expertise in drones and satellites to be able to do imaging and to be able to utilize those also to direct uh, uh, crop production. Um, so, so we have a very, very wide, and I can go on and on, obviously, and I'm very passionate about this field, but maybe I'll let uh, uh, Shirley also uh, do a little bit of talking here. So um, one other thing is that uh, we are very aware of the whole sustainability issue from uh, moving on to more more natural or, and, and less chemical things, which is also related to the water issue we discussed, because basically, uh, you know, if you use uh, a lot of chemicals, then at the end of the day, it's going to end up in the groundwater and in, our, in the food that we eat. So, for example, one interesting concept that, that one of our researchers has is he's been researching agricultural waste in general and uh, cereal husks in particular. So these cereal-based husks are basically from, you know, the wheat, rice, corn, barley, different, different uh, crops. And they can be used for multiple purposes, including a production of, of biogas, et cetera. And this is a well-known, but he's taking it to two um, new uh, directions. One is uh, green seed coating. So unlike today's, um, today's norm, which is a lot of chemical um, coating to seeds, this is a new type of green seed coating that we're taking forward. And the other one is actually uh, improving the seed germination, which means that the seed will produce faster and, and more um, crops. So this is another example of how we work to use whatever limited resources to generate uh, more food. Um, and another thing I want to mention uh, has to do with um, the whole biotechnology issue, because you know generating food isn't just agriculture from uh, the ground is also agriculture from from animals because we still you know need uh, to raise animals. So one of our researchers um, is actually a global leader in applicable research of, of microbiomes, you know, like gut micro microbiomes, which is uh, microorganisms and enzymes, etc. And he's leveraged by innovating data analytics to basically help him um, um, tune the exact uh, solution. So basically, we've spun four of his patents into a venture that is called Ruminera uh, that helps dairy cows produce more high-quality milk with less resources and less methane uh, uh, emissions. So he does that by administering additives to the ruminants that ultimately control the activity of their gut uh, microbes, and that way they better digest their plant feed. So in other words, that enables them to absorb more energy from the feed that they, that they do have. Um, so that's one technology. Um, Let me just cut you off there, sure, sure, sorry. I just want to cut you off and uh, and, and and drive that point home. Okay. I mean, I think that everybody, uh, I, I, I don't know if it's common knowledge, but but uh, methane emissions from, uh, from one of the major sources of methane emissions in the world is from cows. And and what this researcher has been able to do was to be able to determine what it is in the microbiome and the gut of the cow that is responsible for those emissions and be able to introduce different bacteria to reduce or even completely halt those emissions. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a game changer, not just for the cow and for the efficiency of, 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 of producing the, the meat or the milk, but it's also uh, a game changer for, 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 for climate change. Yeah, that's that's a really relevant point here in Michigan. You know, the dairy industry and the cattle industry here. There's so many different just these centralized farms that do so much of this. That's a great example of another technology that could be leveraged here in Michigan. I mean, I think the list is so long. One of the one of the there was a question asked about does Ben Gurion University have a um, have a relationship with any of our institutions here in in the state of Michigan yet? And I said, not at this time. That's something I think that would be interesting to explore when we think about Michigan State's history of being the first ag agricultural university in the country and the first land grant university. I don't want to speak on behalf of MSU, although I am a proud Spartan, by the way, for for the audience. My wife and I are proud alumni. But but anyway, so back to the topic. I think there's a lot of different technologies, and surely. And Josh, you guys could go on for a long time. You know, I, I we we only have about eight minutes left, and I want to just I want to pivot quickly if I can 
just to talk a little bit about about energy because this is you know this is such a, a big important topic for us in the United States and in Michigan and 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 power generation and one of the the great things about Michigan is we're really leading the country in in some of our endeavors around sustainability goals and so a, a lot of different people came together some very smart folks came together um, back in 2020 and 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 created uh, the the they they through a series of discussions and working groups launched um, th under the leadership of our governor. Uh, the Michigan Healthy Climate Plan, and this is really interesting. If you haven't, if you're on the Michigan side and you haven't seen this, I would encourage you to. You can Google it. It's you can just Google Michigan Healthy Climate Plan. There are some extremely um, uh, strong goals that 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 Michigan is leading the country in, and I applaud our leadership in Michigan. I applaud those individuals on the task force that were involved in helping really drive some of these strategic goals. You know, one of those is to be 100% carbon neutral by 2050. That is is extraordinary, right? And Michigan is making dynamic moves to achieve that. Additionally, the state is taking our legislative officials uh, are are taking some dynamic steps to really position Michigan as a national leader in clean energy, and and putting our state on track to achieve 100% clean energy by 2040. So think about that, clean energy by 2040 and what that's going to represent. Um, but there's a lot of challenges, though, that, 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 current, that exist. If you were in Michigan and Southeast Michigan last night, there are many power outages because there were some pretty significant storms that went through and, and a lot of above ground power lines, our, our infrastructure, the grid, and, the, and just high, just, you know, whether it's your standard transmission line, there's a lot of challenges with with energy transmission, storage, um, and, and let's let's talk about some of the things Israel is doing when it comes to some of your energy challenges and how you're addressing those. Keeping in mind, we only have about five minutes left here, so we're going to kind of skip this rock across the pond. What's Israel doing in this energy space? Well, I, first of all, I think um, and this is maybe a source of a little bit of embarrassment for us that we are, um, while we're very good at developing the technologies for renewable energies and energy management, very good at it. And we have some leading companies. Uh, I'll mention Solar Edge, which I hope nobody has stock in because it's not done well, but um, that was a leading company in 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 uh, in uh, the 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 inverter system that they created for managing solar panels. Um, we're very good at, at developing these technologies. We're less good as a country in adopting them. I don't know if Shirley's going to contradict me here, but but I know the government has has a program uh, that by 2030 we should be generating 30% of all our electricity from re renewable uh, sources. Uh, we're not on track for that yet, but we're 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 hoping that that somehow will be uh, obtained attained. Um, what we have been for many many years is reliant upon fossil fuels. Uh, so we have um, um, we've discovered a natural gas field uh, out in our in our economic waters, uh, and about five years ago we began, began production, uh, uh, commercial production of natural gas, which um, there is enough there for our domestic needs for the next forty years. Um, so it's a fairly large field. Uh, um, for whatever reason, the government decided to uh, to. Um, to take that gas and to sell it, so it's it's ninety percent of that gas is now being sold to uh, to Egypt and to Jordan, not not used domestically. Um, so we definitely on the on the let's put it this way on the um, on the domestic side, we have a ways to go in adopting these technologies, but we are very good at developing and exporting our knowledge in these technologies. I don't know, Shirley, if you have something in particular you'd like to uh, discuss. Um, well, we do have some. Um research on perovskite, which are all the new materials for, for solar, um, which we're not, we haven't used locally. We also have recently spun off a company um, uh, that basically will do stuff, which is sustainable air airplane uh, fuels, uh, which is a huge issue globally, and even a larger issue for us here, because within, um, I think it's in 2030, uh, European airplanes will have the difficulty to land in Israel if they're not able to re to refuel with with soft fuels rather than the normal jet fuels that are used today. So we do have this company that will hopefully uh, be a leader. I think it's the leading company in Israel right now, and it's based on one of our researchers 
ongoing work for the past decade. Um, so that's something we're proud of. And um, yeah, that I, I, I you know there there was a question in the chat that came in about uh, was any technology developed at, at Ben Gurion included in the Sustainable Nation film? I Not that I know of. Okay. Yeah. So Josh, also, by said, the way, I'm not sure that uh, whether uh, we do or do not have any work with um, your local university because researchers have uh, researchers have tremendous work with many many U.S. Uh, universities that even some of them we're not aware of because you know they meet in conferences. But it would be wonderful to kind of strengthen that that connection. Absolutely. Yeah, that is something I think we would both agree on. Um, I just not I'm not aware of it specifically, so I didn't want to speak out of turn. And just that's why I said I'm not necessarily aware of it existing yeah. today. So, so look in the last two minutes here as we wrap up. Um, and I guess, hey Rachel, if you want to go ahead and put up the, you know, I, th there's probably a lot of our participants today have a number of questions, and so what we wanted to do is just share contact information. By all means, a a anybody can reach out to our presenters today and ask any direct questions. We certainly welcome that kind of crosstalk and opportunities for collaboration to build partnerships. This is what the MIBA does. We focus on six sectors, and we talked about a couple of them today. Sustainability tech is certainly a priority for Michigan. Mobility tech, food and ag tech is another one of our sectors. Health tech, defense technologies, um, and, and advanced manufacturing industry 4.0. And so Ben Gurion University is doing some really interesting and quite honestly cool things in so many different areas. And I'm truly grateful for our, our presenters today. I wanna thank Josh and Shirley, as well as Ari. And of course, my staff from the Michigan Israel Business Accelerator, as well as the staff from Americans for Ben Gurion University and the folks in Israel from, from Ben Gurion University as well. We wish all of you safety and security. And with that, um, again, Josh and Shirley, thank you. Their contact information is here. And with that, we will conclude today's webinar. Thanks everybody for participating. Have a great rest of your day or evening.